I am Alberto Rovellini. Uh, welcome to my talk. I will be giving you a quick overview of the development of a new Atlantis model for the Gulf of Alaska as part of the project that I'm working on as a postdoc at the University of Washington to evaluate the drivers of present and future uh, system level productivity in the Gulf of Alaska. So a couple of words about the Gulf of Alaska to start. Uh, the Gulf of Alaska is uh, located in the Northeast Pacific Ocean, and uh, it's a topographically and bathymetrically complex place. So you have a complex rugged coastline. Uh, it's a very big place as well. Uh, there's a lot of canyons and gullies and sea mounts on the continental shelf. Uh, it's characterized by diverse benthic habitats and diverse ground fish assemblages, um, as well as seabirds communities and uh, uh, marine mammal communities. Uh, it's a large marine ecosystem uh, that yields uh, high fisheries revenues annually, uh, mostly from ground fish fisheries that are federally managed. Um, and it also exhibits strong fluctuations in productivity, uh, which seem to be driven mostly by um, climate events. Um, so there are some past observation of thermal events that have driven regime shifts in the Gulf of Alaska. And so the Fishery Management Council uh, is pushing on, uh, uh, you know, receiving advice for ecosystem approaches to fishery management. And that's where uh, the Atlantis model comes into play. Um, so this is the project that my postdoc is a part of. Uh, it's the Gulf of Alaska Climate Integrated Modeling Project, GOA CLIMB, and has the overarching goal uh, of combining regional socioeconomic, uh, oceanographic and biological models into uh, a model ensemble, uh, essentially. It's uh, a project that is funded by NOAA and by the North Pacific Research Board. Um, and uh, it's a pretty big team that is working on this, uh, including myself. The lead PI would be Martin Dorn at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center. Uh, but there are, um, there's Isaac, so there are people that have used uh, Atlantis extensively before. Uh, and that there are people that work on different aspects of uh, uh, the underlying science that, that Atlantis is based on for the Gulf of Alaska. So in a couple of words, what we've been doing so far, this project uh, started at the start of 2021. So we've been developing this Atlantis model for the past 14 months or, or so. Uh, and we have a running model now since February, obviously first stages of calibration, uh, a little bit more on that later. So just as an overview, uh, it's a pretty large model because it is a large area. Uh, we got 109 boxes, including dynamic and boundary boxes. And it stretches from uh, uh, British Columbia, so the sort of Eastern tip that you see down there. Uh, it follows the, the arc of the Gulf of Alaska all the way to 170 west on the Aleutian Islands. And uh, it is a shelf model, so we only model explicitly down to a thousand meters depth. We don't really push into any of the big embayments along the Gulf of Alaska, such as Prince William Sound and Cook Inlet. Um, and the geometry, um, as you may notice, is characterized by some complex shapes in the boxes. And that is a result of the complex bathymetry. We've tried to simplify things as much as possible, but there are constraints with the steep bathymetric gradients, as well as management areas in, in this very large area, which includes two countries, uh, including Canada and the United States. Uh, in a vertical dimension, um, we defined six step layers closer to one another near the surface. And uh, we did so by uh, considering things like the stratification of phytoplankton in the spring, for example, the plot on the, on the bottom left, 
or the habitat use of some of the main ground fish species that we were interested in uh, with this model um, and you know how, how they are distributed in the water column or along the slope we kind of placed the the borders of the of the vertical layers that way. For the physics, we are translating uh, ROMS output, ROMS net CDF output, in particular from the Northeast Pacific 10 kilometer resolution ROMS model that has been developed over the past few years by Al Herman here at the University of Washington. Um, and, you know, we're taking temperature, salinity and water transport. We're not imposing any of the uh, nutrient and or plankton variables. So we're not assimilating any of those. We let Atlantis resolve those in-house, if you will. If you're interested in details about the process of translating ROMs into Atlantis forcing files, I invite you to uh, check out my uh, other talk about uh, us doing just that uh, for the Gulf of Alaska and for the California current. A couple of words about the model biology as an overview again. Uh, we are capturing 78 functional groups. The big focus of this model is on ground fish, like I mentioned before. Um, so we have uh, uh, 28 bony fish groups, and a lot of these are single species groups, uh, especially when we have commercial important species such as the Alaska Pollock, Pacific Cod, uh, Art, Flounder, Hollywood, and so on and so forth. Um, we have three sharks groups, three skates, and then obviously some uh, fish groups that are more highly aggregated. Um, you know, taxonomically and functionally, um, as we often do in Atlantis. So we lose a little bit of resolution with those, obviously. Same goes for the mammals. Uh, we have uh, uh, nine groups total of marine mammals, some of which where there is a conservation interest, we keep them single species groups, such as the stellar sea lions and the humpback whales and a couple of killer whale groups. And then we aggregate a little bit more for the remaining baleen whales and dolphins and, and, and toothed whales. Uh, four groups of seabirds, mostly aggregated based on uh, uh, their feeding mode in this particular case. Uh, and then everything else is, is uh, obviously a slightly lower resolution. So we have 26 invertebrate groups and then the, the usual two bacteria and three detritus groups that we need to have in Atlantis. Um, for a lot of the ground fish groups, we do single year age classes because uh, these might become useful in the future if we elect to um, couple this model with the uh, local stock assessment models for the Gulf of Alaska. And we haven't paid, I haven't paid much thought to that yet, but um, paying the price of uh, computation time, we decided that it was going to be worth having, at least trying to have uh, single year groups. Um, and the maximum number of cohorts that we have is 45 for the Pacific Ocean perch. In terms of model biology, uh, we are taking the spatial distributions. So for the for the um, move, seasonal movement parameters and for the initial conditions, we are taking spatial distributions from uh, a number of data sets, including maybe the centerpiece being the bottom trawl uh, data that is collected by the Alaska Fishery Science Center. And we are um, smoothing those data points to uh, regular grids that we can map back onto the Atlantis geometry with a geostatistical approach. And if you're interested in that, I invite you to check out my um, SDM TMB talk in the Atlantis Advances section. Um, and then other data sources that we're using more or less similar ways, including surface troll data, uh, nutrient phytoplankton, zooplankton models for uh, the distributions of some of the, of the plankton groups, plus dedicated data sets for 
everything else. Uh, talking about diets, um, we are lucky enough in this part of the world that we can count on a very extensive uh, stomach content data set that has been collected by the Resource Ecology and Ecosystem Modeling Group for the past uh, 30 years, I want to say, in the Gulf of Alaska and the Bering Sea and the Aleutian Islands um, as part of the Alaska Fisheries Science Center bottom trawl monitoring and that allowed us to come up with uh, preliminary diet preferences. Um, what you see depicted here is mostly focused on the ground fish, so it's not all of our groups, but that is a good starting point for the PPRA metrics that we implement. And uh, obviously with this being a bottom trawl data set, uh, it doesn't resolve some of the species that we have, and so we use other data sets to supplement this. Um, including literature, really, for some of the marine mammals and for some of the seabirds. Um, we are, uh, in, in terms of the, the, the biology uh, parameter files, anytime we could, we took these from stock assessments from the Gulf of Alaska for the sake of consistency. Um, where, where that wasn't available, obviously, we resorted on to uh, things like global databases, like fish bases, per usual. Other Atlantis models have informed this process a lot as well. And uh, I just want to um, um, give a big shout out to people that have been working on this um, before we did, uh, including him, uh, Shane Richards and Javier. Uh, and the R code that they have developed, uh, because we used a lot of that, uh, a lot of that groundwork to build our own machinery to build the initial conditions and the PRM files, you know, as automated as possible uh, way. So where we are at now is uh, dealing with the angry toddler uh, that this model is at this stage. So we got it going in uh, February this year. So after a year and a couple of months of development, uh, we start the Heinkas period on January 1st, 1990. And uh, at the moment we have one year's worth of forcing files, more of that underway. We're doing the transformation for um, the rest of the ROMs Heinkas that we have for the past 30 years. Uh, there's no fishing yet. Um, but we have time series that we plan on using as forcing files uh, for the catch and the removals. Uh, at the moment, there's a lot of testing going on uh, of how the fluxes are doing, uh, polishing things like the diets and fixing some issues that we had with uh, recruitments and specifically when things settle uh, in the model. Uh, we're you know, testing behavior of the migrations and so on and so forth. Um, so we haven't really started the actual tuning of parameters yet. A um, couple of funny things that have been happening. Uh, I was stoked uh, uh, of having the model going for about 15 years uh, pretty early on until I realized that there was no light uh, in the model at all. Um, Couple of, you know, a couple of decades into the simulation, there is a whole bunch of humpback whales that pop up. So obviously that's a, that's a problem, probably, I, I would guess. Um, and then other funny things like placing invertebrates where they don't belong at all or in layers that don't exist and, and this sort of stuff. So the, these are the kind of things that we're addressing at this stage. Um, but jokes apart, hopefully by the time you watch this video, uh, I will have made some progress, but at this time we are stuck in the first year, basically, uh, and we get, you know, flux errors. So it's, it's pretty rough about time to start the actual tuning and calibration of the parameters. And uh, I would love to hear your input about this. Um, how, how do people typically get around the uh, uh, accumulation of biomass in some layers at the start of the runs when they have a new model? How do you determine whether your fluxes, your water fluxes make sense that you have in hydro uh, or if they're too small or too big? Uh, how do you use vermix and horismix to tune things versus 
changing currents in the hydro.nc file, and more generally, really, words of advice uh, for um, you know what, how, how you deal with uh, uh, calibrating a new model, typically. And you can reach me at that email address. Uh, thank you very much for watching.